Hey, welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. Welcome to everybody who's online. I just want to say a certain hi, hi and how you doing to everybody who's out there far and wide. Um, you guys have a, we're all kind of settling in here. There you go. So, uh, you notice uh, Pastor Lou's not here today. Uh, in his stead, we have uh, Robert Halliday who's going to bring the word to you today. Um, I was asked also to read, so we're going to read a psalm real quick, and then we're going to start to pray, and we're going to start in our service. Um, the psalm I'm going to read today is Psalm 23. This is a very important psalm t- to me as a, as a new believer. It was one of the first things I read. And uh, I think it's really, I think it's kind of poignant uh, where we are today with the virus and everything like that. So let me read it here. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for the, through the uncertainty that you are our Lord, that you give us great things, Lord, that you are with us, that, there is, you can, that we cannot hide from you, and thank the Lord that we cannot. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Morning, everyone. We're going to let everybody stand and get ready to worship. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. Darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great Name of 
Lord. Thank you for this life that we can enjoy, Lord. Thank you for everything you've given us, Lord. Thank you for salvation, for eternal life, Lord, for writing our names down in the book of life, for calling us before we were even born. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you. I pray today that the message will go forth, not on deaf ears, Lord, but we will take it and learn and we will carry it throughout our week and apply it to our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. I don't know if it was more beautiful, the prayer or the song. <laughs> Thank you so much, Phil. That was awesome. All right. Just a couple of announcements. I haven't done this in forever. I feel like it just... <laughs> the last time I did this was like March, I think. Um, a couple things coming on today, um, Kids Bible Club and Youth Group, they're not going on today, so no Youth Group, no Kids Bible Club. One week from today, we're going to, after service, have a meeting, a business meeting to vote on membership for Sandra Holiday, a trusted sister in the Lord, and Ron Cusimano, he's like a, another spiritual father for me. So, I cannot wait to vote next Sunday. <laughs> um, remember, next week I believe there also is a time change. I think we're falling back, which I think, believe, might give us all an extra hour of sleep. <laughs> so we'll be a little less cranky next week. <laughs> so, um, so obviously we realize that Pastor Lou is away today. He's, a, he's on a little vacation. So um, we, and we have another uh, brother who's going to pr uh, preach for us today. All right. Um, when they, when they, what does it say? As the pastor's away, the people will still pray. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce you to you. Um, Bob Halliday, he's going to bring the message today, so we're going to come on up. A brother from another mother, but a pastor of the same master. So, as you could see, I have the privilege and honor to fill in for Pastor Lou. And to me, that's a tough task. Pastor Lou preaches God's word as well as anybody preaches God's word. And we thank God for that and for him and uh, for his ministry here. And uh, even in, 
his my own relationship with him. Uh, we have a very uh, Paul and Timothy relationship, and just that he sees fit that uh, he believes in me that I'm able to do this is just a wonderful thing. And uh, I thank God for that. And we're going to pray and then we're going to go into John 5 and we're just going to continue in the book of John. I'm just picking up where Pastor Lou left off. And this is a first. Typically when somebody fills in the pulpit, uh, myself, I preached my own message last time. And I know in times past when like Deacon Steve has filled in the pulpit and others that Typically, we just share what the Lord's put on our heart, but uh, we saw fit that I just continue in the study of John, and I've met with Pastor Lou over the past couple of weeks, and we've studied through it and read commenta com different commentaries, and so, Lord willing, it's a good thing. So let's pray, and then we'll get into it. Our Father in heaven, Lord God, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. You are the one true and living God, and there is no other. You are the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. You are Yahweh of Israel, Lord God. You are our Savior. You are our Lord, and we worship you. We thank you, Father, for granting us faith in your Son, Jesus, Lord. That through Jesus we have forgiveness of sins and the hope of everlasting life, Lord God. That through Jesus, Lord God, we have been filled and sealed with your Holy Spirit of promise and that no one and nothing could snatch us from your hands, Lord. We belong to you and you have made it such, Lord God. We thank you for the gift of faith and for the believing that you have given us, Lord, for the justification you have given us for your word, and that you have not left us orphans, but that you reveal your word to us through your spirit, Lord God. And I just pray, Lord, that you would use me as a mouthpiece today, that you would set me aside and that you would be heard from, that I myself would receive the things of your word first, Lord God, and that I would be able to lead by example, Lord God, as I know you have called us to in Christ, Lord God. I just pray, Father, that you would allow your word to be received today and that you would be glorified and your people edified, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So we've seen some awesome things up to this point in the book of John, right? Amen. We think of, uh, I think of Pastor Lou's um, revelation that there's like these, these bookmarks, these parentheses around the entire book of John and how he's been reminding us, right, pretty often that in 1 John the chapter 1, verse 12, John said, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And all the way at the end of the book, right, in chapter 20, where John writes in verse 30 and 31 and says, And truly, Jesus did many other signs of the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Yeah. So John's purpose in writing the gospel of John was so that we would all what? believe his point is clear he wants us to believe to believe that jesus is the son of god to believe that he's the messiah to believe that he's our savior that he died for our sins and that in our stead he took our penalty and through his resurrection we can have life in his name that's his point up to this point we've seen some cool things right jesus as described as the word of god right which was up in heaven the word which was God and which is God. That's Jesus, right? We see John the Baptist testifying of Jesus as being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We see Jesus, right? We see him trampling underfoot religion in just the most awesome way, taking those, those ceremonial water pots that were filled with water used for cleansing and turning them into wine, right? And just seeing him symbolically say that he's greater than the law. He fulfilled the law. And then we see what? His conversation with Nicodemus. 
We see Jesus breaking religious ties and ranks, meeting with this man, speaking with this man. We see Jesus not caring about social norms, speaking to the Samaritan woman, right? A a Jew speaking to the Samaritan woman. We know how the disciples reacted to that. And Jesus revealed himself not only to that woman, but to the rest of the Samaritans there that he himself was the Messiah. We see Jesus healing, right? This noble man's son. And that through belief in his word, that man's son was healed. Not through belief in the miraculous. So that brings us here to the beginning of chapter 5. And I'm going to read through this chapter up to verse 16. It says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity, 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus answered him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them. He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they said to him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, You have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Pretty familiar story, right? The healing at the pool of Bethesda. We remember this from Sunday school, perhaps, and how glorious Jesus' healing and power is shown over this man's physical limitations and physical handicaps. But there's something deeper going on. The, the setting is a tragic one, is it not? There's this pool, and at this pool, there's a multitude of disabled people, really. That's what it is. Physical limitations, physical handicaps. If you could think of it, you could name it, that person was probably there. And it's tragic because what it reveals to us is the spiritual state of Israel at this point in Jesus' ministry and really throughout his ministry. And what it reveals to us is our own spiritual depravity and the world's spiritual depravity. That's the state. That's what we're looking at here. That doesn't sound like God, does it? I'm going to have an angel go down there, and I'm going to have an angel touch that water, and you guys wrestle over whoever gets in first, and that person will be healed. doesn't sound much like God. So we're going to go through this verse by verse. Right at the beginning it says, After this there was a feast of the Jews. No one's really sure what feast this was. Perhaps it was the Passover. John's writing that is just seeking to explain why Jesus was again going back to Jerusalem. So it says Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Galilee is actually to the north of Jerusalem. But in biblical text, whenever somebody goes to Jerusalem, they always go up to Jerusalem. 
Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Beth Bethesda, having five porches. Now the sheep gate was particularly close to the temple because, oddly enough, that's where they kept the sheep, in the sheep gate. They kept the sheep in the sheep gate for, for sacrifice. Oh, sheep and sacrifice. That was a tongue twister there. So, that's where they kept the sheep for the sacrifice. So, oddly enough, it's really close to the temple, this pool. Which tells me that the religious leaders and all the religious people of the day who traveled back and forth to the temple to worship, to offer sacrifices, to do all these things, must have known that there was this multitude, multitude of disabled people at this pool. What do we notice in the text is none of those religious people and none of those religious leaders are there. That's the state of the world. That's the state that religion puts us in. It renders us useless to God. And so, at this sheep gate, which was right by the temple, there was this multitude of sick people. And it's called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Does this sound like biblical truth or superstition? Sounds like superstition, right? It sounds like a religious tradition that was probably passed down through the ages and that the people at this pool and the religious leaders and just the, the lay followers of the religion of the day had bought into. This shows us that their religion was diseased. It reveals something about the people waiting for the stirring of the water and it reveals something about the religious leaders who kept them trapped there. They had no interest in helping these people. They only had interest of getting them out of their hair. They didn't have interest on, of going down there and showing compassion to these people. They had no interest in that. They had interest in only keeping them in bondage. And what, we, what we're going to see is that when Jesus steps into the scene, we see compassion. We see how we're supposed to act. Not like the religious leaders of Jesus' day, but like Jesus himself. Seriously, not one person? This guy's been laying there for 38 years, and you're over there in the temple worshiping. This pool's 100 yards away, and not one time did you think, oh, you know, if you really believe that this superstition is true, not one religious leader is down there to help this man laying there for 38 years into the pool? That's complete hypocrisy is what that is. And so... This actually, verses 3b, verse 3b to verse 4, this, uh, for an angel waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stepped as he stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the water was stirred was made well of whatever disease he had, was actually not included in the most ancient uh, manuscripts. It was not there. And so most Theologians believe that that was just added to help explain verse 7. So verse 7 says, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. And that makes sense, right? Because we don't know God to act like this. When God's going to heal somebody, he's going to do it individually, and he's going to do it personally, and he's going to do it compassionately, and he's going to do it how Jesus does it, later on in this chapter. So, what we ha I want us to keep in mind here is that this is picturing, characterizing for us that they were spiritually dead. There was darkness there. 
It's a tragic situation. And spiritually speaking, these people were dead. The people that are handicapped at the pool, they had bought an into the lie. Not necessarily their fault, but the people they trusted, the religious leaders, just left them there to believe the lie, to believe the tradition. And so they're probably thinking, well, if they're okay with it, then it must be okay. It must be true. So it's okay that we do this. It's a picture of their spiritual darkness and deadness. So, verse 5. Now a certain man was there, who had, who, now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. I want to think about something real fast before, I, before we go on to that verse. I'm going to th- turn to Psalm. A Psalm. Psalm 11.5. Because we, we have to remember something. Th- this verse that I said was excluded from the most ancient manuscripts. It makes sense that it was, right? Because God... God is not violent. God doesn't love violence like we love violence. And like this was a scene that probably would have become violent. There's a multitude of sick people laying around, lame and paralyzed or whatever, and say I was able body, but my brother was there, and he wasn't. And I had bought into this superstition. I'm pushing whoever I got to push out of the way to get my brother into that pool. That's not how God works, right? So Psalm 11, 5 says, The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. So if God hates violence, he wouldn't be instituting this event where this water was stirred up, where people were probably going to be inclined to violence. Before the flood, God's description of the world was that they loved violence. And one of the reasons he sent the flood was because they loved violence. And so we know this is not from God. This is an example and evidence that they had bought into spiritual superstition and a lie. So now we'll go on to verse 5. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. It's a long time. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition, he said to him, do you want to be made well? See, what we're going to see here is from Jesus an example of what? True religion. What James writes about. James says true religion is, I'll just turn there and read it. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Jesus elsewhere said to the Pharisees, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. True religion is about compassion. It's about mercy. It's what Christ does for us. God's not interested in a religious people. God's interested in a people that is seeking after his own heart. God's interested in a people who have been born again through faith in Jesus Christ and then set out to live out that faith through impacting the lives of others all the while preaching the gospel. That's what God's after. That's not what we saw up to this point, right? We saw spiritual darkness and deadness, and that was due to the religion. God's not interested in man's religion. God's interested in his word. God's interested in relationships with people on an individual level. God's interested in the glorification and purification of his body. That's what God's interested in. That's what God's about. And we're going to see that. So, I want us to notice a couple things here in verses 6 through 9. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? 
Then the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up, a while another is coming, they step down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. So in the midst of this darkness, here comes light. In the midst of their spiritual deadness, here comes life. And that light and life is pictured in the person and life of Jesus, right? That's who we're focusing on now. The compassion of Christ, which is greater than the false compassion of religion. So, we have to notice some things here. Verse 6 says, when Jesus saw him lying there. Do you know that Jesus sees you, believer? Do you know that he stands before the throne of God daily, moment by moment, interceding on your behalf, declaring that you are his? That's what he's doing right now. Standing before the Father, interceding on my behalf. I'm going to turn real fast to Galatians chapter 3. So Jesus saw this man. Galatians chapter 3 verse 22 says, The scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. At one point or or other, each of us who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, who have been born again, were lost. We belong to this world. And we were confined under sin. That is the state of humanity as it stands, apart from Christ. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. Not one of us can stand before God and lay claim to anything, to lay claim to heaven or salvation because of our deeds, our evil. Jesus said that this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, but man hates the light because his deeds are evil. That's the spiritual state of everybody. And that day that you received salvation, do you know something? Jesus saw you. Jesus saw your heart breaking beneath the weight of the commandments. Jesus saw your heart terrified of the thought of standing before him unregenerated, standing before him unredeemed, covered in your sins. Jesus saw you. Just like he saw this man. And to the believer, I want to say, now, as you walk with him, Jesus sees you. Jesus knows you. He says, When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him. So Jesus saw him lying there and Jesus knew him. Think about this for a second. This man had been lying there for 38 years with this infirmity. Jesus, probably about 30 years old now, knew this man before he was even incarnate in the flesh. You understand what I'm saying there? This man had been laying eight years into laying there. Jesus knew him from heaven. Now he's in the flesh and he actually gets to to work out this plan he had for this man. And he's going to. So Jesus knows us. Jesus sees us and he knows us. You, sinner, lost, the person who doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, he sees you and he knows you and he longs for you to come to be with him that he might heal you. What we see displayed here is Christ's compassion. This man never made a profession of faith. This man didn't answer Jesus, yes, I do want to be made well. He explained to him his tragic plight, his tragic story 
that he had been laying there for 38 years waiting for somebody to put him into the water and he never could get in. Jesus was moved with compassion on this man and healed him out of his compassion. This man did nothing to earn to receive the healing. It's the perfect parallel for us, for believers. It's a parallel of the gospel. What one of us can stand and look at the mirror of God's law and think that we could measure up to it? We can't. We go through the law, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt make no graven images to bow down or worship. Honor, but remember, do not, do not blaspheme my name. Do not take my name in vain. That's blasphemy. Honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your mother and father. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. When we look at these things, we see that we've broken each one and that we deserve God's wrath. We don't deserve to be healed. Just like this man who was lying there, completely without hope, with nothing in and of himself to bring about healing, just lying there. He did nothing to deserve what Jesus did. And that's a picture of the compassion that he, each, he offers each of us through the gospel. So this is actually pretty neat. Jesus, in doing this miracle, is testifying of himself as being the Messiah. Isaiah prophesied that in the days of the Messiah that the lame would leap for joy. And here's this man, completely lame, without any hope in himself or the religion that he's bought into and that he's trapped within. Here comes Jesus offering him healing. So Jesus knew him. Jesus saw him. Jesus knew him. Jesus spoke to him. And Jesus healed him. How does Jesus speak to us as unbelievers? He speaks to us through his gospel. He speaks to us through his love. He speaks to us through the revelation of his law and that we can do nothing to justify ourselves before God because we've all broken those commandments. But he shows us his sacrifice. He shows us his love for us. That on the cross, he took upon himself all the sin that I, that makes up who I am and all the penalty of that sin that I deserve to pay in hell for eternity. Christ took that on the cross and on the third day rose again from the dead, defeating death and sin and Satan and giving us hope of everlasting life that all who trust in his name will be raised up with him to life for eternity. That's how God speaks to us. That's how God speaks to the unbeliever. You see, some people think that this man's state was evidence of the fact that he must have done something that was worthy of God's judgment. The religious leaders of the day had that thought. That was a commonly held belief. That if you were doing well in your life, God must have been blessing you because you must be pleasing him. And if you're doing bad in your life, then you must be doing something wrong. And God must be judging you. So sin has ramifications. And sometimes sin can lead to a situation like that. But that's, that's the exception and not the rule. This man would have been outcasted by the religious leaders because they thought that God was judging him. Let's not be like those people. When we see somebody hurting, or we see somebody in a trial or a tribulation, or somebody who's physically handicapped or mentally handicapped, do not think to yourself that, oh, they're not in need of the gospel. God's judging them. That's the way of the world and religion. The way of Jesus is to break on through that darkness with the light of the gospel and share it with them. Share the hope that Jesus extends to them. And that's what we exactly see Jesus doing here. So as we continue to read through this, we're going to see there's a lot of lessons in this for 
the lost, for the unbeliever, called to repentance and faith in Christ, but there's some lessons for the believer too, right? Be compassionate. Be like Christ. See people. Know people. Speak to people. Offer them the gospel that they might be healed. So Jesus said to this man, Do you want to be made well? Verse 7, he says, the sick man answers and says, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool. But when the water is stirred up, and while I'm coming, another steps down before me. This is sad. It's what it is. It's a tragic situation. This man's been laying there for 38 years with zero hope. No hope. Couldn't count on himself to get into the pool. Couldn't count on anybody else to carry him into the pool. Probably wouldn't even matter if he got to the pool first because most likely this whole situation was a superstition fed down the pipeline from the religious leaders to keep them out of their hair anyway. It's a complete compassionless situation. There's no hope, there's no compassion, there's no mercy until Jesus comes in. So the man answers, the man doesn't say, yes, I've been laying here for 38 years waiting for someone to come along and offer me healing. Please, I believe it's you, it's you. You're the one that's going to heal me. It's not what we see. So what's put on display here is Christ's compassion. His sovereign will to heal whom he desires to heal. Out of the good pleasure of his own will. So he says to the man, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. Took up his bed and walk. So, The man needed to respond, right? I wonder if he continued to lay there if the healing would have taken place. Christ's compassion is on display here, but just like his compassion is displayed on the gospel when he shares it with us or where the gospel is shared with us or we share it with somebody else, the gospel requires a response. The gospel is a command to be obeyed. It's a call to believe. And when we respond to the gospel, we're born again. And it's even God's compassion, that, that faith that we have to believe is even God's gift. So here's this man just lying there. He's done nothing to deserve what's about to happen. And Jesus asks him if he wants to be made well. And he just explains his plight and his situation that has no hope, and Jesus responds by saying, Rise, take up your bed and walk, and immediately the man is made well. 38 years of laying there. Do you think his muscles atrophied? Do you think his bones possibly didn't work the way they were supposed to? None of that mattered though, right? Because when sovereign God says, Rise, take up your bed and walk, your body's better, His body's better. Things change. Things begin to work again. And notice the word immediately. He didn't have to go to physical therapy. He didn't have to go see the chiropractor. And listen, I'm thankful for physical therapy and the chiropractor. But that's not what this man had to go through. Jesus healed him instantaneously and completely. But what we're going to notice, just like we noticed throughout the rest of the Gospels and all the other healing accounts of Jesus, is that he wasn't merely interested in the man's physical healing, was he? He was never interested in the temporal. He's always interested in doing heaven's work. So, where am I at on my notes here? So his power is sovereign. 
His, his compassion for us is complete and his power over us is sovereign. The moment you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Your salvation was immediate and eternal. Nothing left for you to do, nor is there anything that you could do to solidify your place even more in heaven because it's all been done through Christ on the cross and his resurrection. Do we fall short? Still? Yes. Do we stumble as we're walking along the road? Do we hit a pothole now and again as we're on that narrow road? Certainly. But your salvation was immediate and complete in Christ. God the Father said, it pleased him that all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily would dwell in Christ. And that in him, we are complete. Instantaneous. The moment you believed, eternity began for you. Heaven began for you. Your citizenship went from this world to heaven. You were transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the power of God's Son and His love. God took us off the broad road and placed us on the narrow road. That's it. It's finished. It's final. Saved and secured. Don't ever doubt your salvation. Because just like this man's healing was immediate and complete, so was your salvation. We haven't realized it yet. The realization of our salvation will will come when Christ returns or we go to be with him. But know that you who profess Christ as Lord, you're saved. If you're saved, you're saved. If you have good, we're called to examine ourselves. Don't get me wrong. Right? The believer is called to look in at his heart and to see and to know whether or not he's truly born again. But we don't do so for salvific purposes. I don't look in the mirror of who I am to see if I'm good enough to go to heaven because I know I'll never be good enough to go to heaven. That's all been sealed through Christ's sacrifice and resurrection. Christ won that for you. There's no more work that has to be done. So, he desires that we live out our salvation though does he not he calls us to walk in our salvation to live as citizens of heaven and that's what we could see through this man too the evidence of the fact that he did believe that jesus had healed him was that he picked up his bed and he walked the evidence of your salvation is a change of heart it's conviction when there was none it's disgust, being disgusted over your sin when elsewhere there was none. It's a desire for holiness. And that's what we see Christ getting at here. He's going to get at his desire for this man to be holy, to pursue holiness. Because something that's interesting that Pastor Lou and I had talked about uh, that Matthew Henry had actually pointed out many, 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 many years ago, was that 38 years this man had been paralyzed. He had laid there. Who knows what his life was really like, but it wasn't much of a life at all, probably. And so, due to his paralysis, he was probably kept from a whole array of sin that he couldn't partake in because of his condition. He still probably was, he still was a sinner and he still sinned, but he was probably kept from a lot of things that could have caused him to sin. Now he's healed from all that. Now he has this new freedom to go about and do with it what he wants. And Jesus' point in going to find this man and talk to him is that he would know not to use his freedom as a cloak for vice. And that's the point that we're going to see for us as believers. 
The freedom we have in Christ is not a freedom that we use for sin. The freedom that we have in Christ is not a freedom that we use as a cloak for vice. We use our freedom in Christ for Christ. We use our freedom in Christ for God and his kingdom and the advancement of his kingdom. We use our freedom in Christ for his gospel. So, it seems like an abrupt change in the text here. John just suddenly points out, and that day was the Sabbath. If you know anything about the religious leaders, they, would not, they were not going to be happy about this being the Sabbath. So the Jews, the religious leaders, found the man walking with his bed and said to him, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Mind you, they probably knew who this man was. 38 years he laid by this pool, which was a stone's throw away from the temple. He, they probably would have known who this man was. But again, just like elsewhere in Scripture when we see Jesus healing on the Sabbath, they're not blown away by what Jesus did. They're hung up on their tradition. They're hung up on their religion. And it blinds them to see what's going on. They would have known what Isaiah said about in the days of the Messiah, the lame were going to leap for joy. Here's this lame man lying there for 38 years, carrying his bed and walking. They should have been like, wait a second, was that the Messiah who healed you? But they couldn't see it. They didn't know what was going on because their religion and tradition had blinded them. That's what we need to know. We need to know and understand that this Sabbath, this Sabbath breaking was not God Sabbath breaking. This was a tradition that the religious leaders had created to keep the people beneath their control. To keep them within their religion. And so they say to him, it's not lawful for you to carry your bed. The man, like any good religious person, pious person. He's afraid. He's afraid because he knows that these people have the power to, he just got all this freedom back. He could go into the temple and worship. He could go into the sanctuary. He could do all these things that he wasn't able to do before. He could go offer sacrifices and, and bring an offering to the high priest or to the priest to offer on his behalf. All these things he wasn't able to do before. And so now, these things could be instantaneously taken away from him. So, this man perhaps has a choice to make. And we're going to see this when Jesus goes and confronts him. Well, not confronts him, but goes to tell him more. To continue his conversation with the man. He has a choice to receive his healing and follow Christ and pursue holiness. Or... He could continue to going on with the religion. And we're going to see here. So he, he deflects all of the focus off of himself, right? And he's like, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. I'm just following orders here. The guy that made my paralysis better, who healed me instantaneously, he said to me, take up your bed and walk. Now, this man didn't know who it was. And we're going to see that. Because Jesus withdrew from him. So he says, Then they said to him, Really? Who is this man that healed you? You were lame for how many years? 38 years? And now you're up and walking and you're dancing and you're able to rejoice and praise God? Who is this man? I want to go see him. Perhaps that's the Messiah. No, that's not what they said because they were blinded by their religion. Who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? That's where their hearts were at. Their hearts were completely hardened by their religion. And they were unable to see the compassion of Christ as evidence to him being the Messiah. They should have known this. 
They should have known that when the lame start leaping for joy, that means the Messiah's here. They couldn't see it. We need to be we need not to be so caught up with religion and the practice of religion that we're of no earthly good. Like as believers, we need to be in God's word and we need to be constantly before the feet of Christ and constantly in prayer that we might serve him in his strength. He's interested in our hearts and our motive and our intention. He's not interested in whitewashed tombs. He's not interested in a people who looks holy on the outside, but inwardly are ravenous wolves who are dead. That's not what God's about. And if you're in Christ... He calls you to pursue holiness and to pursue Him and sanctification, but not for the purpose of salvation. Not for the purpose of adding anything to your salvation, but for the purpose of glorifying Him. These people, the religious leaders, who were attacking this man for carrying his bed, they were interested in looking justified they were interested of having a false righteousness one that they could cling to and that they could say before god did i not do this in your name did i not do that in your name all of these things so there in matthew 7 jesus is getting after the heart of the issue when he says to those people depart from me for i never knew you you who practice lawlessness these religious leaders They practice lawlessness in their hearts. Outwardly, they might have looked clean, but inwardly, they were dead. They were trying to justify themselves, which none of us could do. And so, they're attacking this man. And he says, the one who said to me, the one who who made me well said to me, take up my bed and walk. They're unable to rejoice in that because of their blindness and their focus on religion. So it says, But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. This harkens back to chapter 4 when John makes a point about the Galileans and just the, the, the spiritual state of the people of Israel. They, it says in, in John chapter 4, uh, about the Galileans. So when he had so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him. And as Pastor Lou pointed out last week, that seemed like a great thing. They received him. He didn't expect to be received, but there they were receiving him. Why did they receive him though? Having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast. They received him because they were interested in seeing what he did. They were interested in the miracles, but not interested in Christ. And if you flip ahead into chapter 6, we see Jesus feeding the 5,000 and they quickly come back for more, right? And Jesus says to them, what? You don't seek me because you were, you, you seek me because you were fed. You seek me because of the miracle. You're not seeking me because of me. You're not seeking me because you have any interest in learning more about me, the one performing the miracle. You're interested in having your bellies filled again. They were interested in the miraculous. And Paul writes elsewhere that that was the stumbling block for the Jews. They wanted to see miracles and more miracles and miracles. They were infatuated with the miracles. And one thing that religion does is keeps people entrapped because of the focus on the miraculous and superstition. There's a very human thing about wanting to chase after those things. And they will keep you in blindness and darkness. And that's what we see going on here. So Jesus, there's a multitude, right? Why didn't just Jesus go around healing all of them? You know, he could have. He didn't want the people's focus to be the miraculous. He didn't want people 
to come to him just to see his signs. He wanted people to believe in his word. And that's what we see at the end of chapter 4 when he heals the nobleman's son and it says, so the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. That's what Jesus is after. Belief in his word, not belief in the miraculous. Jesus performed signs and wonders so that people would believe his word, not the signs and wonders themselves. And so that's why it says Jesus withdrew a multitude being in that place. He didn't want to cause a frenzy. Afterward, Jesus, not content with simply healing the man physically, went after him. He found him and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you. This whole progression really had me thinking about the gospel and how we like come to salvation. And I was like, Who, where can I give an example of this from Scripture? And then I was like, well, duh. The Apostle Paul. Jesus saw, saw, he saw him on the road to Damascus. Coming from persecuting Christians and throwing them into jail. Jesus saw him and then Jesus met him and Jesus spoke to him and he believed and received salvation. And that's what's going on here. So Jesus isn't just interested with leaving it that this man is healed physically. Jesus wants this man to understand that he healed him physically so that he would understand some spiritual things. Jesus heals so that we can pursue holiness. That's what God's after us. The Bible says, without holiness, none shall see the Lord. None of us in and of ourselves are holy. Christ credits to us his holiness through faith in him. God takes off the filthy, disgusting garment that I was wearing, that is my sin, and he clothed me in Christ's holiness, his perfection. And then he calls me to pursue that holiness. So Jesus is saying, he's like, I got to go find this man. I got to talk to this man. I got to tell him why I healed him so that he could pursue holiness, without which none will see the Lord. So, this gets us to verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Christ is making a comparison here, is he not? The word worse identifies that for us. This man had lived in a paralyzed state For 38 years. But Jesus is telling him, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. You see, sin's ramifications are always worse than the temporal, physical ramifications of this life. Sin's ramifications for the unbeliever result in an eternity in hell. Sin's ramifications for the believer have us suffer loss when we're standing before Christ and we're giving an account for the life we lived as believers. No matter the instance, whether for the lost or for the saved, sin's ramifications are always worse. That's why for the unbeliever, they're called to Christ to receive his holiness through salvation, that they might be able to pursue him in that holiness. And for the believer, we're called to that holiness, to pursue that holiness, because we know that one day we're going to give an account for all that we did in this body, and we don't want to suffer loss when we're standing before Christ. We want to be able to glorify him to the maximum amount that we're able to. 
And so this is Jesus finding this man and saying, for 38 years, you were trapped by your disability. Now you have newfound freedom. Don't use that freedom for sin. Don't use that freedom for vice. Use that freedom for me. And so, as I studied through this, some commentators believe that the evidence of this man's choice and whom he was go- what he was going to use his freedom for was seen immediately because he departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Fully knowing that the Jews would have been upset because Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. Fully knowing that Jesus would now be persecuted by the Jews because they would have sought to kill him because doing anything on the Sabbath was worthy of stoning. Perhaps that's true. Perhaps verse 15 evidences where the man's heart was at. But the point doesn't change nonetheless. Jesus is after our hearts. He's after the heart of the unbeliever for redemption and for salvation and for holiness. Initial salvific holiness that they might be sealed by Christ's holiness in heaven. And he's after the believer's heart. Is he not? That's what he's after, our hearts. He wants us to progress towards holiness. And that's what we see here. That's what we as believers should be taking out of that verse 14. Sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you. Christ desires us to be holy. Elsewhere Paul wrote what? God is not mocked. He wrote this to believers in Galatians. God is not mocked. You reap what you sow. Believer, you want to sow to the flesh? Doesn't matter that you're a believer. You're going to of the flesh reap corruption. It's going to affect you. It's going to affect how you live for the Lord. It's going to affect your testimony. Sow to the flesh, and of the flesh, reap corruption. Sow to the Spirit, and of the Spirit, reap everlasting life. So, we're going to bring this to a close here. Verse 16 tells us that it was for this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. And so here begins the Jews seeking after Christ to take his life. This is the start of it, right here. This is where they all the plotting and scheming started because Christ healed this lame man on the Sabbath and he went and told the Jews what he had done. But what do we see? As Pastor Lou is going to continue through this book, we're going to see that even though Christ is now going to really start to butt heads and come into conflict with the religious leaders, what we see his glory. <laughs> this is where his glory is revealed. And know that it's in the fires of conflict that Christ's glory is revealed. In his ministry, in the gospel accounts, and in the life of us as believers. That's where our faith is forged. In the midst of conflict and trial and tribulation, that's where Christ is glorified. And that's what we're going to see as Pastor Lou continues through this book of John. So, just to recap real fast. There was spiritual darkness and deadness in this place. The situation was tragic. This man had no hope. Then came Jesus. Light and life broke into the darkness, broke into the deadness with light and life, and he healed this man compassionately. This man who was undeserved of anything, he healed him. And then he called him to pursue holiness. And so we see that for the believer, he's calling us to pursue holiness to pursue him, to sin no more because he set us free from sin, to not use our freedom as a cloak for vice, and to the lost, 
He's calling you to salvation. He sees you. He knows you. He knows your heart. He knows all your religious effort and all the things that you've tried to do to earn his grace. He knows that it's not enough. And he knows that you need Jesus. So repent and trust in him and your salvation will be immediate just like this man's healing was. Let us close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord God, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you, Lord God, that you call us to holiness and that you pursue us as believers, Lord God. We thank you that you strengthen us to walk in your will, Lord God, and that you give us the power to serve you in your spirit, Lord. We pray that you would help us, Lord God, not to use the freedom you have given us in Christ for anything but your glory. And we pray for those listening to this who may not know you or who may believe they know you but worship you in a false sense of religion, Lord God, and don't truly know you. We pray that they would see that you see them and that you know them, and that you offer them grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and that that salvation is immediate and eternal, and that you have won that completely through your sacrifice and resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for this time, and pray that you would just be glorified through the rest of this day and week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I didn't, I didn't know I had to sing a song. Alright, I'm going to do one more song. Sorry the projector's not working today. This is you and I all in all. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus.
Well, this pretty much ends the service now. I'd like to thank everybody who is here today, came out. It's been awesome seeing you all. I'd like to thank you guys all online. Um, also, I'd like, uh, like to make a special thank you to those who have filled in. Um, Brother Bob, if you want to like a nice round of applause for Brother Bob. <laughs> Brother Bob, you admirably filled some large shoes today. <laughs> uh, I'd also like to thank Phil here for that beautiful music we had today. I like tell a special shout out to Haley who, fill, who is filling in uh, on the live stream, making sure that is going well today for us. <laughs> on your way out today, uh, those who are here in the building, on your way out, there is a, um, a box in the foyer. So if you want to give your offering there, it's on the right hand side as you walk out. It'd be much appreciated. If you're watching today online, uh, if you want to send something to us, send it, Carol the Deacons, uh, Fellowship Bible Church, 121 East Prospect Avenue in Woodbridge, New Jersey. Um, if you guys have, um, if I could have um, Brother Hector here lead us in prayer, yes. close us in prayer, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we just want to say a special goodbye to everybody online. If you want to just wave and say goodbye. Bye. 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 <laughs>